our uh, previous sessions, there were about 20 students and now they can, uh, they can speak and understand Nepal Basha, the basic Nepal Basha, uh, they can speak and understand. And uh, the, the different, this institute with the others, uh, wait for a while. Uh, got it. Okay. So what this institution does is uh, it actually teaches Nepal Vasha not only the language but also the grammar and its component also, and uh, it teaches Nepal Vasha in Nepal Lipi. So first, you must learn the Nepal Lipi to learn the Nepal Vasha. So this is the unique feature of this teach Nepal Vasha. And as I said, we have conducted uh, two sessions successfully, and this is our third session. So in every session, what we do is uh, we uh, actually um, bring some guests to, um, to say something on uh, the civilization, about the Newa civilization, about the Newa culture, Newa heritage, about the Newa literature, Newa songs or music. So. As Nepal Vasha is the language of the Newar, so in our class also, we what we do is we uh, bring the scholars, the expertise from the different walks of life uh, to uh, present their views on about the Newa. So, and that also brings the those students to learn more about the Newa and its uh, heritages and all those things. So, uh, in that way, so we have the guest today. And today's our guest is uh, uh, a young, and, uh, and he has been conducting uh, so many heritage uh, walks uh, that has been doing for the past 12 years. And he is the person who is raising voice to promote and preserve the heritages of the Kathmandu Valley, not only the Kathmandu Valley, actually, I should say that he is, uh, um, raising the voice for the, all the heritages of the Nepal. I mean, the different ethnic groups and different, different ethnic languages and all those things. So he has been doing th that kind of things also. And um, he is uh, somehow a writer also, and he writes in the different magazines about the heritages and cultures of the uh, Nepal. And as well as uh, he has so many credits, credits to him. I mean, uh, he is a freelancer photographer. He is a cine cinematographer. He made um, many documentary documentaries and uh, he made short movies also. So he's a filmmaker also. And, uh, uh, and uh, what I should say about him. Uh, so today he is going to say about the, uh, the, the, the settlements that has been built in this Kathmandu Valley how the settlements were built, the Newa settlements, how was it built and how it is different to that of the other um, civilization. So it is about the civilization. So he will be uh, uh, presenting on those things. So please welcome the uh, energetic, the social activist, Mr. Alok Siddhi Tuladar. Uh, Alok, Chita Thugu Jajole Jozalapa. Yes. Uh, 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 you saw, saw Tadu. Uh, yes, yes, we can hear you. We can hear you. Uh, Tadu, Tadu. Uh, so please, now it's all to you, and now you can carry on. Super. Yes. Sakashitan, uh, Josilapa. Good evening, good afternoon, and maybe good morning, uh, wherever you are. Uh, Thank you very much, Pavitra Dai, for the nice introduction. But I am not as young as he said because you can see my hairline, uh, which is maybe just a little bit, uh, I don't know, different from Pavitra Dai's. I'm, I'm his cousin brother, actually, uh, a year or two younger than him. And uh, I think, although I do different types of work, uh, what I'm most proud of is my. Uh, professional work, the work that I make a living out of. As a documentarian, I make documentary films for a living. And this is the work that actually uh, brought me into the field of uh, uh, 
uh, activism for the preservation of culture and heritage. So uh, before I begin, uh, I'd also quickly like to share the Facebook Live uh, on my uh, Facebook profile. So it's already in uh, the Teach Nepal Vasa is right? Okay, I'm sharing it. Please give me 10 seconds. Okay, done. So, uh, what I'd also like to say at the very beginning is, um, the second thing I'm very proud of here is being uh, here in the core city of Kathmandu, being born here, being brought up here, and now living here. Uh, the most, uh, the second most, uh, the thing that I enjoy second most is doing these walks, these culture walks that Pavitra that I mentioned. So I have one tomorrow morning, but it's just about Swembu and uh, the uh, participants are already uh, finalized for that. But for this group, uh, the third 12 people here uh, and any of your friends who are interested, uh, let's organize a short walk in the core area of Kathmandu anytime in the this coming week or weekend or following week. So uh, we'll be talking about uh, one specific aspect of the ancient uh, Newar civilization today. And whatever we talk about today, we will actually try and discover those physical uh, 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 remains of that ancient civilization in this uh, coming week. So uh, can someone from this group, one of the organizers, uh, administrators of Teach Nepal Vasa, take uh, the responsibility to organize that. So it'll be a two hour walk in the core area of Kathmandu. Uh, it's, it's totally free of cost. I do not charge for these uh, walks. Uh, is uh, Sadiksya or who is, uh, if you think this is a good idea, let's do that walk. Uh, but I need one of you to uh, take the responsibility of organizing uh, like when, where, uh, and how do we do it? Th those kind of small uh, logistic things. Uh, I'm, I'm uh, just offering you my time and whatever little knowledge I have uh, to take you around. Uh, how does that sound? Okay. Yes, I'll look, sir. Uh, I'm not there in Nepal physically, but uh, I'll <laughs> see what. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll then I'll coordinate with Pavitra Dai so that he can reach out to uh, all of these uh, individuals uh, here, and then we will organize uh, this. It's uh, it's pretty uh, straightforward. Okay, now let's go to the main uh, discussion of our, uh, the topic of our discussion today. So, uh, uh, let me see. Uh, uh, is there anyone here who is not in, uh, has never been to Kathmandu? I thought I saw a foreign looking name or face here. If you have not visited Kathmandu, please raise your hand or please uh, make a noise. All right, everyone has been to Kathmandu. So my job is much easier than, uh, but nevertheless, let's, uh, maybe uh, try to visualize a little bit by kind of like a small meditation uh, practice that will just take us uh, uh, into uh, the uh, prehistoric Kathmandu Valley, uh, which will take maybe 30 seconds or maybe uh, 45 seconds. So I request you to all close your eyes and imagine that uh, you are a uh, an angel or a fairy or some kind of uh, divine uh, uh, being up into the clouds. I hope you're closing your eyes now. You reside up in the clouds and you look down on earth and you see on the foot of the Himalayas, a very, very pristine and beautiful lake that has been formed by all of the ice melt, 
the glaciers that have flown down into this valley from the Himalayas and eventually filled it up because the water got trapped. It, 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 it had no place to go out of the valley. And then whatever little water got evaporated during the uh, dry, hot seasons, it was replenished very quickly by the monsoon rains. In fact, the rains that rained down in the valley throughout the uh, year. So it became a very uh, beautiful, pristine lake where lots and lots of aquatic animals lived. And then at one prehistoric time, many, many eons ago, which is not dated, which is not a scientific uh, fact, but uh, during legendary times, one of the uh, primordial uh, Buddhas, meaning uh, a Buddha who came here, uh, who lived before the historic Gautam Buddha. So many, not, not just many thousands of years ago, but many eons ago. That means uh, an innumerable uh, number of uh, centuries and millennia ago. Uh, one of the uh, primordial Buddhas came here and saw the, this beautiful lake and planted one seed of a lotus flower in it. And eventually the lotus grew in the middle of the lake. And then it also gave out a very bright light, which became a holy uh, light that was famous throughout the entire region where holy men from the south and the north came to, uh, to this lake to pay homage. And then after some time, another holy man, a bodhisattva by the name of Manjusri or Maha Manjusri came down from the Wutaisan mountains in China, looked at this lake and thought because of his divine wisdom, his Manju, Maha Manjusri is known as the uh, God of wisdom in Bajrayana, the uh, Mahayana Buddhism, Tantric Buddhism. He decided that, okay, this is a very holy place. So it's not only the aquatic animals, creatures who should live here, but also human beings should live here. So he took his golden sword and with one blow, he opened up the gorge, which is now in present day Chobar and let in the Southern edge of the valley and let all of the water out. So that is the historic, sorry, uh, uh, that is the uh, legendary account which tells us how human civilization began in this Kathmandu Valley. But if you look at the scientific uh, analysis, we know that at about 30,000 years ago, there have been uh, different geological surveys of the Kathmandu Valley, and they have proven that up to 30,000 years ago, Kathmandu Valley was in fact a lake. And Chobar, where the gorge is today, is an area full of hills uh, made of a very soft limestone. So that is the area where it, it will even, uh, it, it does erode away uh, much quicker than other areas surrounding the valley. So that is how uh, the erosion uh, gradually turned into a gorge to let the water out gradually. And still today, we can see that the Bagmati and the Bishnumati rivers, uh, after they join at the confluence in uh, Tekudoban, and it is called the Bishnu, uh, Bagmati River uh, after they join, uh, that river still flows out of the Chobar goes uh, today. Uh, so now if you still imagine uh, the shape of Kathmandu Valley, uh, like all other valleys, like most other uh, big valleys of this type, it is in the shape of a bowl. So if you look at the Bagmati River as the lowest point of the uh, valley, inside the middle of the valley, and if you look, put your uh, sight towards the north, where uh, uh, the uh, one of the highest peaks surrounding the valley, uh, called uh, Shipucho in uh, Nepal Bhasa language, also known as uh, Shivapuri, uh, protected uh, area. That is where, at the bottom of that Shipucho hill, is where all of the uh, civilization starts. In fact, uh, in one of those areas is the ancient town of uh, Sako, uh, also known as uh, Sankarapur or Saku, 
that is believed to be the first settlement, uh, human settlement in the ridges of the Kathmandu Valley where the, uh, uh, after the lake uh, got drained. So even now we can hear many, uh, well, I know of at least one uh, group of clan of Bajracharyas and Sakyas in Kathmandu. Uh, uh, they, they belong to uh, Baha right now called, uh, known as a uh, Srikhanda Tarumul Bihar, or locally known as Shikhamu Baha. They are, they are right next to the Kumaris, the Royal Kumaris house in Kathmandu Darbar Square area. So this clan of Sakis and Bajracharyas claim that they actually migrated to Kathmandu many generations ago, and they uh, from uh, Sanku. So they claim to be the original inhabitants of uh, Kathmandu Valley. Not on the valley floor, but in the highest point of the valley after the lake got drained. So from uh, Sanku, Sako onwards, if you go south towards the middle of the valley, you will see that the plain, uh, the geographical plain of the valley gradually descends from uh, Bhujasi area, Naranthan or Burailkanta. That's all the same. The local name is Bhujasi. Towards, uh, if you go uh, south towards the center of the valley, uh, towards uh, Basbari area and then uh, Marajganj, uh, Panipokhari, Lanchor, all the way to uh, Jamal, and then further down, uh, go past uh, uh, Tinkhyor, Turikhil, the big open uh, space, uh, straight towards uh, the Bagmati uh, River across the street from uh, present day Tripurashar and Tapatali. So that is where it actually meets the lowest point. But at the same time, if you also consider the other side of the valley, uh, where one of the highest peaks again is uh, Fucho, the hill of Fucho, or popularly known as uh, Fulchoki. Uh, at the bottom of that is uh, Godavari, Nagarpalika, right? Uh, the Godavari town. And from there again, you descend uh, towards the middle of the valley, but this time from south to north. Earlier, it was from north to south as you descend towards the lowest point. Now you descend from uh, south to north, uh, towards the middle of the valley, towards the Bagmati River. So you go past uh, cities like uh, Barigaon, Harisiddhi, uh, and then finally enter uh, Lalitpur, the Patan, uh, ancient city of Patan. And then as you descend from Patan towards Bagmati, again, if you, once you go past uh, uh, present day Kupandol, you finally meet the Bagmati River. So the bowl sheep all ends up at the middle of the valley where the Bagmati River flows. And uh, that is why uh, the, uh, the presence of the river there is so important to uh, start exploring the history and the culture of Kathmandu Valley because more and more now scholars are now have started to call the civilization of Kathmandu Valley is actually the civilized is actually the Bagmati civilization. So I don't think historically in uh, in of our in any of our ancient documents the word Bagmati civilization has been used too frequently or if used at all, but only in the present uh, uh, last uh, the present modern times uh, and uh, with uh, and and the scholars that are still living they are starting to use the term Bagmati civilization. And to me, it makes perfect sense because it is on because of the uh, availability of the Bagmati river and not only the river as a means to get a water, but on, also as the Bagmati as a very, very holy body of water is, th th that is the reason uh, why I think uh, connecting our civilization with the name Bagmati directly makes a lot of sense. Uh, at one time, even if you look at the physical uh, remains, well, not only the remains, but it is actually, you can say, uh, on the banks of the Bagmati River, there is so much of physical uh, built up heritage that has been built over not only centuries like, uh, a few centuries or a thousand years. Maybe it goes all the way up to 1500 or 2000 years where 
people uh, have been building monuments along the banks of the Bagmati River. And at one time, it was even a longer uh, stretch of area, a monumental area, religious area, that was even longer than the Ghats in Banaras, where, where even now the Banaras Ghats are known to be the la largest Ghat in the world, uh, cremation site and Hindu pilgrimages site. But at one time, the Ghats along the Bagmati River that started all the way possibly from uh, uh, Poshupati area and ended up in the Teku Doban area, which would have stretched maybe, I don't know, five or six kilometers or four kilometers. There are continuous built up uh, monuments, uh, monumental areas and cremation areas uh, along uh, in that stretch. But right now we can see bits and pieces scattered along that stretch uh, where there are different uh, areas where there's nothing uh, remaining, but there are certain areas where there is still a lot uh, remaining. Uh, there is, there's still a lot in Poshupati. Then when you come to Sankhamul, you can see the uh, Ghat area as well as built up areas. And then when you finally reach uh, Thapathali, uh, where uh, uh, very close to the maternity hospital, if you start from there and continue south towards Tikudovan, you will see a continuous stretch of two and a half kilometers of unbroken uh, Ghats. And uh, temple and shrine areas, mostly Hindu, of course, but, but there is a lot of Buddhist monuments at, uh, as well, where they, there, there, there are Lichibi era monuments there all the way to, uh, you might say modern uh, uh, monuments built by the Shah and the Rana uh, rulers or, or during the Shah and the Rana dynasties. Uh, so this is uh, one, I think, uh, proof of where uh, we can say that our civilization can be called the Bhagmati civilization because it developed, it fostered, and it grew on either side of the Bhagmati River. In fact, uh, there's a very popular legend about how the name Nepa came into being. Uh, so one legend, of course, this is uh, not uh, documented. It has been passed on by word of mouth for uh, many generations. But um, according to uh, this legend, a very, um, wise uh, ascetic by the name of uh, Ne Rishi or Ne Muni was the first person to come and meditate at the site where the Vishnumati and the Bhagmati rivers met, which is now called uh, Deku Doban. Uh, and because uh, he was the first person to meditate there and uh, start a human civilization on the base of the valley, on the floor of the valley, from that point, uh, the name of this valley was called Nepa. And uh, obviously when we have the word, uh, when we have the long uh, sound A ah, at the end of anything, at the end of a consonant, like Nepa uh, eventually become uh, Nepala. So that is how the word uh, Nepal came into being, uh, according to this uh, legend. Uh, it has been, uh, it's, it's, it's pretty popular and to me also, uh, quite uh, believable, although there are other uh, explanations behind the name Nepal uh, or Nepa, but this is uh, my favorite one. So, um, do you have uh, any questions or comments so far? I think I'm getting very monotonous, so let's also uh, please feel free to raise your hand and ask me or give your comments whenever you like. Uh, but I think I need someone to moderate this, maybe. Uh, Sadichya or anyone who, uh, who can, uh, yeah, even, even right now, does anyone have any comments, questions? Okay, uh, but I need to know if uh, anyone has gone to sleep. Is, is anyone getting bored? <laughs> no, no, Alok, sorry, it's really interesting. I don't think anybody can okay. fall asleep in your, <laughs> during your talk. All right, thank you. Yes, and thank you, Jeevan Sresta, also acknowledging saying it is uh, clear. Good. Uh, so, okay, uh, we talked about uh, the physical uh, built up areas on uh, the Bagmati uh, rivers. We talked about the naming of Nepa. Uh, and now 
let's talk a little bit about uh, water itself. Because in any civilization in the world, the first thing that you need to actually build a city or a settlement or even a village or a house is water that you can uh, use for your daily needs. Uh, in the case of Bhagmati civilization, uh, we have such a system of bringing water to your community, which is unprecedented in the world, which was never uh, invented anywhere else in the world, and which is still functioning without any human intervention for 1,500 years. Alok, so there are like, I think two um, comments. Right. One is from Anurup okay, yes, Nakami. Yeah, there are two questions. So one is from Yazu. Right. And the other okay. one is from let, let me start with the uh, Bhagmati. Mm -hmm. uh, origin of Bhagmati is uh, Bagdwar. Does anyone know where Bagdwar is or what it stands for? If you do, please enlighten us. Bagdwar one, you say Bako Mufwata Aiko and Ra Okere Aisar. That's correct. Dr. Kota Sate Tawa and Molen. Okay. If you look at the natural uh, uh, geological properties of Kathmandu Valley, of course, we have the valley in the valley base, and all around are these uh, hills and mountains that were at one time, maybe even uh, a, say, half a century ago, it was covered by very, very dense forest. Uh, even now you can see some protected areas like uh, Fucho and uh, Shipucho, that is Fulchoki and Shivapuri, still covered by dense forest, uh, even uh, Chandragiri Hills, which we call uh, Tilacho. But more and more they are being, uh, uh, destroyed. The forest cover is uh, being destroyed. In fact, uh, uh, when I asked my father, what do you call those hills uh, that you see in the distance? He said, Haku Gung. I had never heard that word before. I just heard it like uh, a year or two ago. And what that tells me clearly is Haku, of course, is black and Gung is uh, forest. So when you look at it, it's always dark and black. That means it is very, very dense. So it's only now with all of these uh, basically various human activities, uh, mainly due to greed, of course, that uh, there's so much of deforestation going on that we are losing uh, Bagmati. So the point I'm trying to make is when there's a huge forest cover, what does that do? It attracts water. It attracts water from the atmosphere. It traps all of the rain in the roots below the trees and all of that water that is trapped below the trees in the ground actually seeps through the ground when there's uh, more moisture than the ground can handle. When there is a saturation level that the ground reaches, saturation of oversaturation of the water. That water, those, those uh, I'm talking not about uh, streams or rivers in the mountains. Of course, there are thousands, hundreds of them, but I'm talking about uh, the water table of the ground that actually is like uh, clouds under the ground. Those are uh, molecules of water, small drops and droplets that seep from an area of higher pressure to lower pressure. That also seeps, gradually moves from higher elevation to lower elevation. So that is also known by known as a capillary action. If some of you have studied um, science in school or college, so. When there is uh, huge forested areas, there is always uh, lots of uh, moisture under the ground. And that moisture eventually collects into an underground or overground spring. And that spring will create a small rivulet because of a gravitational force from a higher ground to lower ground. And that is exactly what uh, Bagdwar is. It is a natural spring in the middle of the forest in uh, Shivapuri, where later on people realized that, okay, this is a very important uh, source of water. So they put uh, uh, an image of a, a 
tiger's head uh, at the source of the water. And right now, it, if you go there, it looks like the water is flowing out from uh, the tiger's mouth. But that is the actual source of the Bagmati. Even in the peak monsoon, it has got very little uh, water flowing out because it's a small stream. But what happens with all of these small streams is it is as it goes downstream, it starts collecting all of the smaller, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the subsidiary uh, springs that join this river. There's a name for it, I forget. So it grows bigger and bigger. So by the time it reaches uh, Sundarijal area, down in uh, Gokarna area, it is quite substantial. Of course, if the pollution was not there, even if you look at the pictures taken by uh, people like uh, Tony Hagen in the 1950s or 60s, you can see that the water from the Bhagmati is so voluminous and so pristine that, uh, of course, even in my school days, when I went to school uh, in uh, Lalitpur, I used to cross the Bhagmati River and during monsoon times, I could see the Bhagwati River flooding and I could see sometimes on the way back, I could see people swimming in, in, in the Bhagwati River just below the Thapathali uh, Bridge. Uh, and of course, those are all just uh, uh, memories now. Uh, but the source of Bhagdwar, uh, the source of Bhagmati is this. Now you might call it a shrine, it's called Bhagdwar. Similarly, the second major river in Kathmandu Valley is Bishnumati. Uh, the source of that is Bishnudwar which is also in the Shivapuri uh, area, uh, a little bit towards the uh, west, I think. I've never been there. So you can see how these forested areas actually are a source of life, a source of uh, civilization for, uh, for the entire Kathmandu Valley. And uh, as, as the Bhagmati flows out of Kathmandu Valley from Chowa goes towards the Tarai, it supports so much of more life all the way until it reaches uh, the Ganges River uh, uh, and empties itself into the uh, Bay of Bengal in um, at which point exactly I'm not sure is it uh, Kolkata anyway that was a very good uh, uh, very good question thank you so and uh, for the second question yeah, the answer is already there. Jivan has uh, replied to it, so let me not uh, repeat that. Uh, okay, so uh, shall I go on then? All right, so we're talking about the water, bringing water into the cities. So I made a very tall claim. It seems it's, it's a very uh, big claim about how 1,500 years ago, uh, during maybe the peak of the Bhagmati civilization, our Kathmandu Valley civilization. Well, it might not be the peak, but it was very much a climbing, uh, uh, at the climbing uh, stage of the civilization. Our ancestors built water systems that brought water from the outskirts of the valley all the way into the city center, the communities where people can come down of their houses with their uh, water pots and take the water uh, to their house, carry their uh, water, for household use, for drinking, for washing, for uh, uh, ritual purposes. Uh, and that water system is now working, uh, some of it, of course, a very small percentage of, of that is working for the last 1,500 years without any human intervention or maintenance or replacement. How is that possible? First, first of all, which one am I talking about? I'm talking about one very good example uh, of uh, Mangahiti, or you can call it Manihiti, which is the stone water spout, water fountain, water conduit, whatever you call it. The actual, the real word is Hiti, right in front of uh, Krishna Mandir in uh, Patandarwar Square. It might also call a Sankan Hiti because Hitis are always uh, built in a slightly lower elevation below the street or the ground level, because mainly because the Hiti works with the principle of gravity. The water is for flowing from a higher elevation to a lower elevation. That is why the Hiti needs to be in a lower uh, area and there are always steps leading down to it. Okay, so. Alex, sir, I think there's some question. Uh, Jeevan has raised his hand. Ah, the tiger said, right. Uh, 
there, I, I'm really not sure why there is a tiger head uh, at uh, Bagdwar. It is, uh, I think, a good uh, research question. And by the way, the research question phrase that I'm using is a good uh, way of saying, I don't know, please go and <laughs> find out yourself and share it uh, with the rest of us in the next discussion, if you can. Uh, but that is, yeah, quite interesting. Uh, it might somehow, is it related to the famous uh, temple of Bagh Bhairab in Kirtipur? Uh, maybe not. And there, there are legends, uh, really nice stories, uh, at least one nice story about the Bagh Bhairab uh, temple in Kirtipur, but Bagh Dwar, I'm not sure. Sorry about that. Okay, so uh, going back to the Hiti, uh, if you look at uh, other civilizations in other parts of the world that started maybe 2000 years ago, 3000 years ago, even older than that. They of course all had water systems that were brought in into the city center from a very uh, distant place from the actual water source. But if you study all of those, civil, uh, study how or why all of those civilizations died away or they had to relocate the entire population to the city of the city to another area, the, the number one reason for that is the water source in the city center dried away. They could not keep it running for a very long time. The, uh, the result being the entire civilization, the city had to be moved elsewhere, but not here in Kathmandu Valley in Nepal Mandal. So I don't know how many Hittis were built. There were probably thousands. Mm, yeah, that's a good point, uh, Saditya. Uh, would you like to take a minute, try to explain what a Hiti is? Um, I don't know, like I can explain it like very formally, but I just know that there are like these ancient like water system through which the water just keeps on flowing continuously. And you can find a lot of them uh, within the Kathmandu Valley around a lot of different places. And the water is always like really cool. The water that flows from it, it's like really cool. I personally used to enjoy a lot because I used to live in a place where the Hiti was like nearby. And like, I remember like my parents used to go and like collect water from there and it used to be like really cool water. Where did you live? Uh, earlier, like there was this place called uh, Tapa Hiti in Lalitpur. Uh, yep. Yeah, so we used to live there like at some point uh, when I was a kid and like right across the Haiti. So I remember those days. Okay, here is a Haiti, uh, a royal Haiti inside the Hanmandaka Palace. Can you see my screen? Yes. This is very fancy, but let me show you a Haiti that. Uh, the regular uh, people used. This one is in Godavari. Uh, it's called Nodara because there are nine Hitis. And look at the volume of water in each of these Hitis. So you can imagine uh, quite clearly, uh, quite easily, why there's so much of water here because it is just at the base of the uh, large uh, Fucho, very high Fucho hill, the Fulchoki hill in, in Godavari. So of course there is plenty of water there. So the, how the, uh, and of course many people go here as, because it is a religious site for the purity of the water, uh, for the water having such holy qualities. Uh, and there's uh, also Pansdara just outside of this with five more Hitis. But those are all cascading Hitis in the sense that at the very top level are these nine Hitis. And when the water flows out of this, it goes underground inside the, uh, mm, it's, it's not a sewer system, Nikas, uh, the outlet of the Hiti. And eventually that outlet actually uh, works as a supply system to the Hiti just below it. So Gadavi is a good example where, uh, I'm not very sure about it, but the, out, the excess water from this nine heat is actually accumulates underground 
and it gets filtered by natural processes of the uh, soil in the ground. And then that filtered water actually gets trapped inside what is known as an aquifer under the ground. An aquifer is basically nothing but a collection point or a tank, water, water tank underground, which is uh, most of the time made from baked clay so that it, it lasts for many centuries because we know that once clay is baked, it can last even 5,000 uh, 5, years as we have seen from uh, discovery of uh, intact uh, clay pots from the Mohenjo-daro or Harappan civilizations that are being dated to 5,000 years old. So similarly, uh, most of the underground uh, structures of the Hiti uh, that help to collect the water, the filtration system, the diversion systems, uh, the canals are all made of baked clay. So uh, they collect this uh, excess water from the outlet from this nine, no, no dara, nine Hitis into a uh, baked clay uh, water tank underground. And from that, they create, they, they uh, construct uh, underground pipes, more again, made of uh, baked clay, sometimes even of wood that can last a couple of thousand years easily if you take the best quality of agrat wood. So uh, that uh, channel, uh, those pipes channel the uh, clean uh, filtered water into the next level of heat is just below uh, Nodara, which is called Pansdara in the case of Godavari. The same can actually be seen even now in Dhobigat area of uh, uh, Patan, uh, just next to Jaulakhel. So there is an uh, Hiti in the upper part of the Dhobigat area where the water from that Hiti is totally drinkable because it has been, people have been drinking that water for centuries. And just like 10 or 20 meters uh, below that Hiti is another uh, set of uh, another, uh, sunken pit Hiti, which is called the actual uh, uh, Dhobi Dhara because it's only the Dhobi community, the washerman community that use that water from the second Dhara, the lower Dhara, the, the, low, the lower Hiti for washing the clothes. And the reason for that is in the upper Hiti, it is pure drinking water, but in the lower Hiti, because the water supply is from the lower Hiti is actually the overflow of the excess Hiti system and the groundwater actually does filter it to a certain extent, but it, it does not filter it in a sufficient uh, level to make it drinkable. So the lower heat is water can only be used for washing purposes. So that is why it is called Dhovigat. You can even go see the example today. So uh, these are two examples where there are two cascading heat is close to each other, but this also tells you how, gives you a hint about how the heat system actually is built. It is a network of all of these heaties where one supplies water to the other over a certain distance. But in the middle, what we have not seen here is a huge number of these uh, ponds, large ponds built by uh, people to actually uh, uh, serve as a reservoir for the water. So, uh, so what actually happens is from the edge of the hills, uh, from the uh, base of the hills uh, in the edge of the valley, like uh, Shivapuri or Shiputso, uh, Fulchoki, Futso, or even in, uh, if you look at uh, Bhaktapur, the Bhageswari Hills on the way to near you know, on, in the Nagarkot area. Those are all watershed areas where a lot of water is collected naturally. And when they come out of the ground as the springs, so what our ancestors did was they built canals from those springs and brought it towards the edge of the city. And those canals are called Razkulos. So obviously there were Razkulos in all three cities. The ones in uh, Kathmandu uh, city and Kantipur and Lalitpur have been totally, uh, sorry, Kantipur and uh, Bhaktapur have been totally lost. It's only uh, historical uh, data now. But the one in Lalitpur, which starts from the Lele area, buzz, buzz, uh, a Tika Bhairav area that still exists. And that Raz Kulo is actually still supplying water all the way to a town called um, uh, Sunaguti or Techo, somewhere nearby, uh, Chapagaon, for irrigation purposes, even now. So the Lalitpur municipality and the other municipalities in that area have been actually working in the past few years 
to revive that Razkulu, the Royal Canal, and bring it back all the way to Laganquil, where it originally was. So I don't know how they're going to solve the problem of getting that Razkulu over a ring road in Saddo Bato. Will it be a, a flyover for just the water or will it be underground? Will they have to pump it? <laughs> I, I don't know, but it seems technical studies have been done or are being done and it is still possible to uh, fill up the pond at Lagan Khel called Saptapatal Pokhari with that Razgulo water, where once that pond is filled up, then the result that is expected is that hundreds of Hittis inside the uh, city of Patan will actually start flowing with water. So you know what I'm saying. Once the natural water uh, source is brought close to a city by the canal, and it is stored in a reservoir like Saptapatal Pukhari Puku in uh, Lagankhel, which is actually right next to the bus stop. And that uh, Pukhari also has its own very uh, um, touching history of how a local government school actually encroached on that uh, pond and built its commercial building on top of the pond. And how the locals of that area fought a legal battle for 16 years. And now just last year, they have won the battle and have been able to uh, claim the land, uh, claim the pond as a pond, but not a private property of the school. The school building actually has been removed. And now the process of uh, revitalizing that pond is going on. Uh, if the Razkulu comes, all the, all the good and better. Otherwise, it is just the surrounding uh, um, rainwater harvesting during the monsoon season uh, that can actually keep the pond full and functional for the rest of the year to recharge the heaties of Patan. So similarly, there are examples of such ponds all over Bhaktapur area, uh, uh, ponds at different levels for a reservoir uh, and ponds for flood control. If you look at the example of uh, the hot topic since the last uh, a few years in Kathmandu of uh, Rani Pokhari, it was actually built by Pratap Malla in the 17th century. The legend says everyone knows it is to uh, console his uh, queen because their son had died. Of course, that was one of the reasons, but the main reason I think he built it was as a reservoir to collect all of the uh, monsoon uh, excess uh, flow of water during the monsoon. Instead of letting that excess uh, water uh, eventually go into the Bagmati River, uh, which would actually cause some flooding in uh, the pathways of that water. He actually uh, placed this pond in such a strategic place that it would also collect, uh, the uh, do the job of rainwater harvesting and store the monsoon uh, water for the heavy monsoon period of uh, three months. Uh, some people also seem to believe there was a Razkula all the way from uh, Pujasi, Burail Kanta area that came all the way till uh, Rani Pokhari to fill it up. Uh, but uh, we really don't have any uh, historical scientific evidence of that, but it was definitely a reservoir for the uh, rainwater harvesting. And after the rain stop, uh, what that pond would do, what Rani Pokhari would, how Ra Rani Pokhari would function or how the Saptapatal Pokhari in uh, Lahan Khel would function is that the ground below it at the base or the sides are built in such a way that it retains the water to a certain extent, but when there's lower pressure of uh, water in the ground uh, behind the walls or be uh, below the base of the pond, it would actually allow seepage of the water from the pond to surrounding area so that that seepage would actually charge the wells inside the deep uh, core areas of the human settlements of the Kantipur city or Lalitpur city. It would also charge the aquifers, the collection uh, tanks built underground uh, that are just behind the, right next to the Hittis. And that is how uh, it is ensured that the Hittis will keep supplying water even during the driest season, how the wells would also have water seeping into it throughout the year even when it is not raining. So you see how now it is forming a network of the, it starts with uh, the rain, the clouds, uh, the moisture in the air, uh, 
uh, that falls on the ground that is trapped by the uh, trees and then the underground uh, capillary action of the trees will actually form a spring near the base of the hill and then the man-made canals uh, brings that spring water into the near the uh, city where it is actually poured into a pond to fill it up and then that pond also collects rainwater and fills up and during the dry season uh, it actually uh, works as a supply uh, source uh, a source of supply uh, through underground means through underground channels and through natural uh, uh, seepage uh, of the water uh, in, in in very small quantities but continuously to recharge the heaties and the wells so that is a system where it largely depends on uh, the natural ra rain cycle. It largely depends on man-made structures that are hidden underground, that are built underground, uh, so that there is no need for uh, cleaning or human intervention. Because once it is underground, it is obviously protected. No one, it is not easy to destroy it, except by earthquakes, of course. Uh, and then the last thing I want to uh, mention here is that uh, many times uh, these uh, canals or the uh, channels get uh, clogged because of uh, dirt or even uh, uh, leaves and uh, even man-made uh, waste. Uh, so especially when the, uh, the nikas, the outlet of these cities get uh, uh, clogged, there has been, there is a brilliant system of uh, human intervention where it is not possible to clean those very long underground uh, uh, sewers for the outlets of the water with any other device except this uh, biological intervention. And that biological intervention is actually possibly the reason for us to celebrate uh, Nag Panchami every year. Okay, now, do you know uh, what I'm talking about? Is is uh, this is a quiz? Come on. So if anyone can tell me how Nag Panchami is related to the cleaning of the uh, sewer system of the outlets of the Hiti, uh, please raise your hand and please feel uh, free to uh, speak up. Anyone? Okay. So this is uh, news for all of you. But when I learned about it a few months ago, uh, I was so fascinated that I thought, okay, I'm going to share this as much as I can. So when the waterways get clogged, first of all, they send some very small fish inside the uh, blocked waterway. And right after that, they send uh, frogs that are slightly bigger. These are all living fish and living frogs, slightly bigger than the fish. And then at the end, they take large snakes, the largest they can find, and send it right away after the frogs. So what's happening here is the fish is trying to wriggle its way to come out of the other way, other, uh, uh, other side of the uh, drain. And the frog knows that there's fish in front. So it's trying to go as fast as it can to catch the frog uh, because frog uh, is, is, uh, is, is, is it's a food for the frog, right? And right behind is the snake who is chasing the frog now to fill up its belly. But as all three creatures wriggle through the uh, canal, the blockage gets cleaned in a very, very natural way. And for this reason, we worship the fish. We worship the frog at least once a year during Gumpuni. And we worship the frog, sorry, we worship the snake on Nag Panchami. Okay, uh, does, uh, does, does this make sense? Uh, I mean, Kripa Shrestha said it happens on Siti Nakha, but it might be true that it happens on Siti Nakha because Siti Nakha is the uh, National Environmental Day of Environment Day of uh, uh, Nepal Mandala, or you might call it National Water Day, where <laughs> you clean your water sources mandatorily as your cultural uh, responsibility or even religious responsibility. Uh, but that actually responsibility is uh, 
an added layer to our culture where the real reason of celebrating city Naka is to clean uh, the water systems to make it uh, functional for the rest of the year. Uh, but uh, we know that uh, on Nag Panchimi Day, we definitely worship the, the snake. Uh, although the actual putting the snake inside the drain might be uh, on a different occasion. Uh, anu, I had goose up, goosebumps when I first heard this story, just like you did. <laughs> uh, anu is asking, uh, why is the elephant boar fish and these animals are there on the Hiti carvings? Uh, that's a very good question. There are different interpretations of that. Uh, but a few days ago, maybe what, uh, two weeks ago, I posted about this on uh, Facebook, where I was actually uh, relaying what uh, a famous uh, scholar of uh, Newar art, Gautam Bajracharya, wrote in his book uh, a few years ago. So he said, all of these animals, some of them are real animals, some of them are imaginary. Like the most common one is, of course, the makar with the elephant's uh, um, trunk and the crocodile's uh, mouth merged into one. It is uh, called uh, makar, which is also the uh, bahan, the transport of uh, goddess uh, Ganga. Uh, so all of these animals are actually imaginations of the artist who is doing the carvings. So he is getting inspired by all of the shapes that he sees in the uh, clouds. So during the monsoon time, when it is about to rain, we have a very ancient belief that uh, it is also related to the uh, god uh, Kumar, who is known as the rain baby. But uh, let's not go into that right now. Uh, going back to the Hiti, the artist looks at the clouds just uh, at the break of the monsoon time when there's lots of clouds and he sees all of these shapes in the clouds and he imagines whatever shapes he sees are the shapes that he's actually copying into the carvings of the Hiti. So that is uh, Gautam Bajracharya's explanation, which I also thought very fascinating. So I posted about this. There are actually uh, two more questions. The first one is by Jeevan. He's asking how old might be the oldest city in the valley? Right. Uh, the one uh, that I spoke of earlier, Manga Hiti, Mani Hiti in uh, Patandarwar Square. There's an inscription that says it was actually built in 570 CE. And it is still functioning with water, drinkable water. So that is the oldest known functioning Hiti. There are other uh, Hittis uh, that are not functioning anymore, that even actually the structure does not exist, but there is an inscription that talked about the first uh, Hitti system. Uh, that inscription was found in Lele Valley. Uh, and the date mentioned is also around the same time, but uh, slightly earlier than 570, maybe, uh, same century, if I remember. And that inscription actually used the word uh, pranali to describe uh, ET. It also has to do with the uh, maintenance system uh, for uh, that ET. Uh, and that system was actually nothing but a guti. So guti is the intangible part, uh, the association that actually keeps these uh, ET running. Uh, by maintenance or by worshiping or by cleaning or in whatever way. So that inscription uh, uh, to uh, the translation, the direct translation of the word pranali in that inscription is uh, the Hiti system. So now we understand pranali is, uh, pranali is system, isn't it? It is a Sanskrit word. So if you use any translation services and translate the Sanskrit Pranali into English, you will get system. So imagine 1500 years ago, 1600 years ago, they could already determine that the Hiti is nothing but a system. Because if you go back to what I described earlier a few minutes ago, this network, the cycle of water that they have uh, harnessed 
uh, using uh, the natural uh, water cycle, using gravity. See, when I started talking uh, in the session, I started by the slope of north to south and south to north, ending up with uh, Bagmati as the lowest point. The thing I wanted to highlight was how the water can take advantage of the gravitational force by flowing naturally from a higher point to a lower point. All of that is a very, very simple part of a system where you really don't have to invent anything. You don't have to invent gravity. <laughs> you just need to be aware of it. You just need to know how it works. Now, we all grew up talking about celebrating uh, Isaac Newton in the what uh, 15th century or I think 16th century as the person uh, uh, who so-called, who, who many people think invented gravity or who discovered gravity or who um, uh, first talked about the principles of gravity. Okay, in the Western world might be, but now we know that 1500 years ago or even earlier than that, we know how our ancestors really, really understood gravity so well that they, they designed these systems based on gravity to make this ET Pranali, the ET system work for 1500 years, 2000 years. And now uh, I've been lucky to be very close to some individuals and groups who have been studying this ET system so minutely. They have been uh, running uh, radar systems to see what is inside under the ground without digging it up. And when there were opportunities to actually dig up the water supply canals under the ground, they measured it in so min such minute detail that they are convinced that the real reason why the Hiti system works for 1500 years and why in some Hitis, one particular Hiti in, in, in particular called Alko Hiti in Patan near, uh, um, on the outskirts of the city, uh, Alko Hiti, uh, where they have very large volumes of water that are consistent throughout the year. No matter how much rain there is, or no matter how much, uh, uh, drought there is during the dry seasons. The amount of water that flows in that heat is constant. That is because there are mechanisms inside the ground behind the heat which control the level of water so that it does not cause any harm to the uh, physical uh, systems of the heat and it does not dry up. So what I'm saying is you know how destructive water can be. In fact, uh, there are many uh, valleys all over the country, all over the world, which are just formed by rivers. When a river flows through the same place for uh, many thousands of years, it erodes the land so that it actually forms a valley. The flat uh, surface of the uh, earth becomes a valley because water will erode it. And now just think of a Haiti where the water is running there constantly for hundreds of years, for a thousand years. Will it not erode the system or the conduit where the water flows and damage it? And one fine day, the damage is so bad that the water will be diverted elsewhere. It will go out of control. But not so in our Hitis. Because our Hitis have been so precisely engineered in such a precise manner that they know exactly how much water will flow into the heat, how much force that water will apply into the structure on which the heat is flowing, and how much of an inclination should be uh, created in the, in the channels or in the canals so that it will not, the, the pressure of the water is not so much that it will uh, gradually destroy the structures. And the water pressure will not, should not be so low that it will not reach the destination. So imagine the amount of uh, calculation that they need. Of course, there was no scientific mathematical calculation at that time when they built it, but they all learned it by doing it over and over again, learning by doing, learning over the mistakes and improving on the technical skills that they had. And all of this is something that we never knew. We never uh, even imagined that it would be there. That's why we did not talk about it. And that's why we always relied on uh, so-called uh, Western or so-called developed uh, development from the Western world where they bring in 
uh, projects like uh, MLMT, which turn out to be a disaster even before it starts. And eventually, if the MLMT does come into place, uh, how long will it last for? How long will it work? Can they guarantee 100 years? Forget 1,500 years. Can they guarantee that it'll run for 200 years or 20 years? We don't know. But whatever the guarantee is, we know that it is in a number of years or decades or centuries, not in terms of millennia that we have seen in Mangahiti in Patan. So you should go out and explore Mangahiti and Alkohiti. By the way, Alkohiti is the corrupt form of the name. The real name is Alokhiti. So next time we meet or talk about it, let's call it Alokhiti. Agreed? Thank you, Alok, sir. Uh, there's one more question by Kripa. She's asking, is there any mechanism in place to protect these Hitis nowadays, given that uh, many Hitis are waterless due to urbanization? Now, the only mechanism is to stop the uncontrolled urbanization. And by that, I mean, it's a different discussion. We know all know that I'm, I'm sure you've been hearing or talking about the need of the day to save our civilization is to move the capital so that people from all over the world, all over the country don't just come here just because it is the capital and they want to build a house here. That is their lifetime dream. And as long as that dream exists, there's no way to protect. It's, it's just uncontrolled, unplanned uh, way of uh, so-called development. But we can also, of course, start with our own small steps by just looking around, keeping your eyes open in your locality, in your neighborhood, in the places where uh, you were born, but you might have left, or in the places where your father, your ancestral home is. Uh, even if you cannot go there, there's so much of information available right now online on the internet, books, uh, official government sites. I know Kathmandu Nagar Palika is actually doing a, a, a geographical mapping uh, survey where they map all of the Hitis in Kathmandu city and put it on a map where, where they document it, take photographs, put it on a map, put some basic information. I mean, there's, there's lots of destruction going on, but at the same time, there are these small baby steps that are being taken by individuals at the grassroots level, at the by the uh, local level government, uh, which is very encouraging, gives me hope. So we just need to ensure that that momentum and that awareness grows uh, bigger and bigger, and more and more people can actually act on it, take very tangible uh, steps to protect these uh, fast disappearing uh, uh, icons of uh, civilization. And eventually, I hope before it is too late, uh, when the people like you, uh, younger people, uh, will reach at the stage where you have the authority, the power in your hand to actually enforce the preservation, uh, then, it will, uh, then we can see the changes very quickly. But to reach that stage right now, I think, we are at a level of very uh, rapidly increasing awareness, especially at your uh, age group level, which we need to really push and promote. And uh, discussions like today's discussion, I think is a very, very good way to get into that uh, in the deeper discussions like this, no, no, not just a quick uh, Instagram post. <laughs> okay, Anu, uh, uh, would you like to put your question here? And talk. Let me hear your voice too. Um, okay. Um, thank you, Alok, sir, firstly, for giving us a lot of insight into uh, how history has evolved to be uh, what it is right now. So, one way, one thing that uh, uh, I learned in my fellowship, which was in built environment, um, was that uh, a lot of cities across um, different uh, countries have been applying for UNESCO Heritage City Credition. So now Patan Darbar Square has a credition of UNESCO Heritage Site. So with, with the accreditation of UNESCO Heritage Cities, um, uh, UNESCO uh, forces the government to do certain activities in the Heritage City that allows it to preserve 
uh, not only the tangible culture, not only the heathy systems and uh, uh, the, the physical things that we can see, but it also helps to preserve the intangible heritage, which could mean like the profession of certain uh, craftsmen into certain professions um, like copper in pattern and uh, other uh, handmade crafts and that this cloth that they make. So all, those, all of those things that uh, enforces the government to um, implement certain uh, uh, way of preserving that lifestyle as well. So uh, that is, is one possibility that I see uh, still in Patan or Bhaktapur because these places are, uh, uh, they still could be preserved. They're not really entirely modernized yet. Uh, but for, for that, we need some political influence to happen. And, but I think still think it's possible because it happened in Ahmedabad. Like I think Ahmedabad is the only city in all of India that has brought this accreditation. It's the walled city of Ahmedabad, Ahmednagar. Uh, and then there's one in Vietnam, I think Dan, it's called Danang, uh, where a lot of such works have been happening and people are actually paid to practice their older professions. Uh, so what, what benefit uh, government has is it brings in a lot of tourism. Which, which helps their economy and of course like it also helps fill the pockets of politicians so it, hence it, it works i don't know right i agree with you totally or no where are you from if i may ask oh i'm i'm from india but i live in Patan now um okay yes great and how's your nepal bhasa coming up i'm still learning so okay. <laughs> Good, good, good. Uh, very happy to see you in this group. And I agree with you uh, totally in what you said. I just want to clarify on uh, two points, uh, giving an example of uh, Nepal, where <clears throat> in 1979 CE, uh, we got enlist enlisted as a World Heritage uh, Site. And Nepal is probably the only, Kathmandu Valley is only the, is probably the only place where in such a Within such a small uh, geographical area, there are seven designated monument zones that are all within the UNESCO World Heritage Zone inside Kathmandu Valley. Then there's, there's three more in Nepal, which is Lumbini. Uh, and then uh, the other two are actually the natural uh, World Heritage Sites, Sagarmatha National Park, Everest National Park, and Achito National Park. But that happened in 1979, and it's been, uh, what, 80... Uh, 22, 40, 40 plus years, <clears throat> there's not been a single uh, new addition to the UNESCO World Heritage Site in Nepal. Although I understand there are 25 more uh, uh, areas in Nepal which have been uh, 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 identified as potential uh, UNESCO World Heritage Sites, uh, but uh, not a single one has been actually uh, even shortlisted. So my point is, it takes so much of uh, work to get enlisted. I mean, of course, first of all, there is a lot of paperwork, documentation, information that needs to be collected. And then it is only the Nepalese government or any government that can actually send the proposal to UNESCO. So that means it requires uh, uh, a huge amount of uh, political will at the political level, at the upper level of the government, the Ministry of Culture, for example, or maybe the Prime Minister's office, which in the case of countries like Nepal, uh, heritage and culture comes up big time in all of their uh, speeches, but when they actually put uh, action to their words, it's always lacking. The priority for uh, one's history and culture uh, and heritage is very low. Uh, of course, they do. It does. It does make perfect sense that it does bring in uh, tourism, quite a lot of uh, tourism revenue to the country. But even then, it's it's that part of common sense unfortunately escapes the people at the very top. So, even the other day, I was at a meeting where uh, a city like Panoti, uh, just next to uh, Banipa and Dulikhel, that has been under process uh, for. Uh, UNESCO uh, World Heritage Enlisting. But that process has been going on for many years and it seems the file is finally at the Ministry of Culture, 
and they have not forwarded it to uh, the UNESCO office for whatever reason. Mm. So yeah, this is uh, an area where maybe uh, scholars and local governments and people at the even uh, bureaucrats at the right um, uh, level of the government can maybe uh, uh, initiate things or push things if it is uh, stuck. But yes, definitely this is a good uh, point. Thank you for bringing this up. Uh, we're doing, we've already crossed an hour and 15 minutes. Mm, yeah, but let's continue this uh, question answer uh, for a few more minutes. If anyone has any more comments to make questions, additions, share your own experiences, thoughts, please. So we talked about how being able to harness the power of water, the natural cycle of water, actually enabled uh, Kathmandu Valley or Nepal Mandala to be one of the uh, best civilizations in the world that is sustainable, that is environmental friendly, and that is uh, very dependent on itself. Uh, unfortunately, these aspects, uh, sustainability, for example, is the global buzzword right now because of climate change. Climate change is caused totally by things that we have done, we have done in the last uh, century or two, things that we have done that are not sustainable. Industrialization, for example, we now understand, we now all acknowledge that it is not sustainable. Uh, pumping water with uh, electric motors or cleaning the waters, uh, the, uh, the purifying the water with uh, uh, chemical systems is not sustainable. Whereas using the natural filtration uh, capacity of the soil, uh, using gravitational force for, for water is, is sustainable. So sustainability is something that we can actually teach the world right now, just with the heat system. That's something that we, we which is uh, part, which should very much be the number one uh, intangible uh, world heritage uh, that is uh, a concept that is floated by UNESCO. See, in addition to just like Anu mentioned earlier, in, in many other countries, even in India, there are uh, UNESCO enlisted intangible world heritage uh, uh, enlistments, whereas in Nepal, we have none. Uh, I don't know if the Hiti would come into tangible or intangible. Uh, I know that many music and festivals come into intangible, but even the characteristics, the properties of the Hiti, the way it is engineered can be uh, an intangible world uh, heritage system that actually teaches a huge lessons to the world about something so important, so uh, timely, like uh, sustainability, isn't it? Have you ever looked at it this way? Now that you know about the Hiti system, forget the actual supply of water from the Hiti, because we know like in Kathmandu city, uh, Kathmandu Valley, there's so much of population that even if uh, half of the old Hitis were revived, the water that it would supplies will not of course be anywhere sufficient to, uh, for the needs of the uh, 50 lakhs or 40 lakhs population of the valley. But look at the lesson it teaches us about uh, the concept of sustainability. Isn't that something that itself is reason enough for us to at least try and preserve the existing Hittis or if possible, even go and revive one or two or a dozen Hittis in, in places like uh, Patan and Bhaktapur where, where Anu rightly said, because there's not been so much of destruction compared to Kathmandu city. Maybe it is still preserved. It is still possible to preserve a lot of those Hittis and even revive some of the Hittis. Yeah. I think that is a good angle to now start thinking about it. And eventually those of us who can, we can talk about it more, we can spread the word. And people, if you are in the field of conservation, uh, in journalism, in whatever field you are, there's always angles angles where you can bring up this topic, environmentalism, sustainability, uh, climate change, eco-friendliness. If you look at it in, from every angle, you can bring in the heat is education, so many ways, tourism. 
Yeah, here we have another question from the Kamal again. Uh, so, what is the scope of earning a living for young people in Kathmandu in the field of culture and politics? Okay. <laughs> There's been <clears throat> so little of uh, you know, professionalism that has been applied in the field of culture and heritage that the first few individuals or the first group or company who actually takes uh, culture and heritage uh, preservation as their field of work, I think they'll become very, very rich. See, I make uh, documentary films for a living. When I started, I made a few short uh, documentaries on my own without uh, any uh, one paying for my time and skills. But later on, when I really wanted to uh, sustain myself and my family with that work, I went looking for projects for uh, NGOs and hospitals and even uh, government in uh, subjects in fields that had I had no interest in, no interest in and I ended up finishing the work but in a very very uh, uh, unsatisfactory uh, way unsatisfactory even to myself but later on I realized that okay if I go after a documentary projects about culture and heritage it would pay me money, help me make a basic living. And I'd also be very happy with my own work because this is the real topic that I'm interested in. And once I got, went after it, I did get a few projects of making about making documentaries about one that I remember is called uh, Kirtipur People and Places. It was about the need to preserve the open spaces and the ponds in Kirtipur. Uh, it was a 10, 10 minute documentary, but it, it was one of the most satisfying projects I've done. More recently, I've done uh, a, another 10 minute documentary about an intangible heritage, very unique uh, uh, masked dance performance, uh, the ritual tantric dance called uh, Nilbarahi dance, which happens every year in uh, the town of Bode near Timi. Uh, so that is just an example, but if, if there's a company, architecture company who just specializes in uh, retrofitting old uh, individual houses all over Kathmandu Valley. And if they can really find that niche market of clients who want to retain their old house and uh, preserve it by retrofitting it, make it livable, and also make it look better for maybe tourism purposes or for whatever reason, or for them to live there for the next uh, uh, several decades, Look at how much money they will earn because right now there's no individual or company who is offering that service. And <clears throat> uh, I, I brought up this example because right now it's been just a month or two, I think, that Kathmandu Metropolitan City has announced a scheme where they give up to 32 lakhs. It starts from 12 lakh rupees, depending on the uh, various... Um, parameters of the project, but it goes all the way up to 32 lakh rupees of direct uh, anudan contribution to the owner of the house who wants to uh, retrofit that house without demolishing it. Or if you want to demolish it and build it from the ground up, but if you want to, if you are, if you can, if you do uh, rebuild it with certain uh, uh, features of the original uh, architecture of Kathmandu Valley, like just the facade should look like the old uh, Newar houses, or if they build, uh, rebuild it with uh, wood, mud mortar and bricks, which are the original Newar architecture, then there is a certain amount for that. So depending on how you rebuild or retrofit your house, it goes all the way up to 32 lakhs of uh, direct cash contribution by the Nagar Palika to the house owners. So taking just advantage of this scheme, this architecture company can uh, for example, start identifying these houses and talk to the individual house owners and get that contribution of 32 lakhs from the Nagar Palika and use that uh, to rebuild the house while keeping his uh, profits uh, 
as, 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 as required. So this is just another example. So similarly, there are so many different uh, ways where you can come up with novel ideas while where, where you can preserve the culture and heritage of Kathmandu while making a good profit and a living out of it. And once you see that one or two companies do well in that in the next two or three years, then in the next five years, there will be a boom of 100 companies who are trying to do the same thing, which might lead to different uh, scenarios of uh, unhealthy competition and all of that is still there, like in any business. But the biggest impact of that will be that there will be of so much of uh, preservation of uh, uh, culture and heritage because the financial gain aspect has come in by then. So I think it's just a matter of starting, uh, you might call it a, a startup company or a new startup venture or an idea or an innovative company. But I think entrepreneurs should now, it is high time they look into this as a, a potential business area where they can uh, grow and also lean, make, uh, become a model for others to follow in the next 10 years, 20 years. And I'd be very happy if that happens. I mean, I, I've tried to do it in a very small way in the documentation work that I do, but there are bigger and better things to be done where I think it's again, young people, I think should take the lead because you are the ones who have the energy and the ideas and the approach. So yeah, that's a good uh, question. Thank you, Anu again. Any more? Been going on for 90 minutes now, starting to get hungry. <laughs> so are there any more questions? Also, um, last year, Alok sir shared his uh, um, documentary links with us. So I can share that, to the, share that with the students. There are like, I think eight, seven or eight documentaries he shared with us. So I will share those with you. Uh, after the end of this class, and you should like definitely take a look at them. Yeah. And of course, he has invited us to join his uh, approaches work. So we will manage the time and we will get to know. Yeah, you guys who are in Kathmandu, yeah, you should definitely go. <laughs> so as you said, it would be about two hours long, right? Yes, that's right. And where we start from? Okay, I think uh, we can uh, work it out. I mean, it, it is a new uh, uh, walk that I'm offering just to this group. And of course, okay. you're always welcome to bring in your own uh, friends, uh, relatives, uh -huh. whoever is interested. Uh, the group should not be larger than 20, I think. It is, uh, it'll be difficult to manage if it's more than 20. So anyone interested, uh, if there's, uh, let's say five people, anyone be, anywhere between five to 20 people, let's do it. So I think Pavitra Dai and I will uh, work offline to work out the uh, details of when, uh, where, and then we will, Pavitra Dai will inform all of you. So I'm mostly available uh, anytime. We'll just work out a slot and uh, Pavitra Dai will uh, communicate with you. So all of, all of the details. And one last thing I would like to add here is more recently, I've been uh, really digging into my archives of all uh, photographs I've taken actually, and my also my old collection of other people's uh, photographs taken uh, before I was born and trying to research a little bit about uh, the history and the, actually the hidden uh, aspects of, of those photographs. And I've been posting them trying to post one every day or a few a week. And here in the chat of this uh, Zoom, the chat uh, area, I put my Facebook profile. So if you want to follow me or just uh, glance through those uh, posts, uh, I, I think it might add a little bit of a different uh, perspective on uh, Nepal Mandal's uh, history and it's uh, why it is, I think, still relevant today. Why we are, we should, claim our space as one of the best uh, civilizations in the world uh, during the medieval times. I mean, not anymore, but I still have, feel there is still such a lot that we can claim as uh, a proud uh, legacy that our forefathers uh, 
forefathers uh, built, but uh, we could not really capitalize on it. But it's still not too late, I think. So I've just given you my Facebook uh, profile link on the chat area. So <clears throat> we can go on talking and talking and talking. So <laughs> Okay. Thank you, you very much, Alan. Uh, yes. So let's give her a, a little support to our significant to that. Uh, so he has elaborated so many things about the Kewa civilization and the, how this Kathmandu Valley was built. So later on, when we will get him, then he may have a little more questions to ask. So at that time, we need to call out. Things that are curious to you. Okay? So let's hope that we will meet someday. But uh, I would like to ask you are you coming out these days? Uh, like this, this type of time? Do you, mm, do you it's you a question, Motula. But do you usually go out this time? I mean, that's going to be Corona time, and lots of people are still uh. living home. So. <laughs> no, no. I, 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 I'm I not, done I'm with not, COVID. I don't, I don't come south. I, I, I'm yeah. asking about the others. So okay. are you ready to come out? Okay. Then we will manage the time. Uh, so it would be better maybe if it is on Saturday. Okay. Or we can, Pavitra, if I may suggest, we can yes. wait for a week or two, and once the COVID situation gets even better than now, we can do. I mean, it's it's a lifelong offer, so we don't have to rush. Uh -huh. So we can wait for a month, two weeks, three weeks, whatever. <laughs> okay, then, uh, thank you very much, Alex. Okay. So, so you know, I really enjoy it. Uh, yeah, yeah, please. Yes. I, I enjoyed uh, being with you. Thank you for patiently listening to me. Uh, and at the next opportunity, I'll be back again. So thank you for inviting. Subha. Thank you, Alok, sir. We'd like to invite you again in the future for another talk. And we all look forward to that. Thank you very much for your today's talk. Okay. It was really interesting. And we hope yeah. to learn more from you. Thank you. Thank you. My Subha. pleasure. Subha. Bye bye. Uh, So with this, we are concluding today's class also. So there is no other sentence of the day today. <laughs>